My life is just an example of a righteous pursuit from a man from Tonga. We always think the American dream is accumulating big houses, you know, having nice cars, but his righteous pursuit was just us maximizing who we were supposed to be, and having those resources that America did have that we didn't have before. It's not that Tonga wasn't a good place, it's just that America was, was way more resourceful. Although his dad was first generation, didn't really speak much English or he, he knew as much as he did, he knew what he wanted for his son, which was to succeed. So. Although he didn't know nothing about football, he found Judge Memorial, this little Catholic school, sees kids playing football and he's like, I have one son. He knew what he wanted for his son, which was to be strong in the gospel and to be successful. So in the NFL, right, the main, the main goal is to get in and get your foot in. And this, when you get your foot in, uh, the next goal is stay in as long as you can. You measure it by years, but you also measure it by how many contracts you can get. So I get to my third contract. It's supposed to take me to 10 years. But at the time, I just felt that I had maximized the phase that I was at in life. But we just felt like, okay, there's more. There's more, there's more purpose. The Jets had made a change in management and we got a, a, a new general manager. And the general manager came in, just rearranged a lot of the different contracts and ours was one of those. We looked at it as a window to say, okay, maybe this is the time for us to move on. So I called my bishop and wanted to talk to him. He looked at me and he goes, how are things? How are things with your family? I said, they're going great. And he says, do you have enough? And I said, yeah, yeah, I have enough. And then he looked at me and he says, I would think on that. My dad was an avid temple goer, worked at the temple for several years as a Tongan immigrant coming to a new place, right? There's new dynamics that the youth face that he would never have understood, right? Well, one thing he did understand was he, he understood the gospel. So when I turned 12, he said we were gonna go do baptisms Saturday morning. So I was like, okay, cool. So we went Saturday, then we went the next Saturday, then we went the next Saturday. So when I was 12 till I was 19, we went to the temple every Saturday at 5.30 in the morning. But that was his way to say, I'm not smart enough to raise my son here because I never grew up here, but I know that this is what I can do. It was never the plan. My plan was do 10 years, let's finish these three contracts, let's go ahead and stack our chips, let's do our deal, right off into the sunset. I was going in there thinking, Bishop will tell me, no, don't do it, yes, don't do it. But he gave me some things to ponder and reflect about. And when he said, do you have enough? Me and my wife already knew what the answer was. You've been living your dream, and now you're gonna get it cut short by your own decisions. I, like, I had no clue what I was gonna do. I closed my eyes and we just drove by it, and I knew I just had to gut through that drive. And we just drove right past the, the facility and went straight to the airport, and we came to Salt Lake. I got called to serve the people in the Bountiful Sixth Ward and Bountiful as their bishop. My thought went to 12 months ago, I was sitting on an NFL bench. And now I'm sitting here, sitting on this bench. Then my thought went back, that was enough for that time and season in my life. And now it's time for this. My dad was a worker at the Salt Lake Temple for a years. long, for years. That was one of the, the individual sacred things that I was able to do. After my dad passed away, he says, can you come to the temple and clean out his locker? So I went in there, his jacket, his shoes, socks and that kind of takes me back too because that's the locker room that's really important he's had a son that has had a locker at university of utah had a locker there as a coach and as a player one in new york and here at byu now that i really think about it and that, that experience he had the real locker he had the locker with the team that meant the most Gandhi's quote that I love and quote so much, and I try to strive and live my life to it is, he said, my life is my message. And I would hope that my life is a message of the things that are important for me, important to me. I would hope that as I live my life, people wouldn't have to refer to what I say, but more of what I do and how I live my life. That goes back to my dad. 
He didn't want nothing. He didn't want no money. He didn't want anything like that. What he cared about the most, whenever I try to make a, a meager attempt at buying them dinner or getting them something, are your children taken care of? Is your wife taken care of? Are you living comfortably? That's what he wants. So that's why I was attached to Righteous Pursuit, because it never was about him. It was always about me. So when I think about his blueprint uh, that he has about leadership, I'm sure all he did was said, this is what my dad did, and he did it in his own way. He has a way of bringing out the best in his players. You know, he coaches a tough position that's known for toughness and physicality, and he has his own unique way of getting that out of his guys. You know, he's not cursing those guys. He knows the sport of football, but more importantly, he knows people and cares about them on a different level. Probably a huge reason of why he's so happy and sees the, the success that he's had today is because of, of that man who he calls his dad. You just look at the way he lived his life. But I'm sure he used the Savior as the model as well to say this is how he lived his life and that was his message. You would say, oh yeah, leave a legacy, leave a history. And that quote hit me hard when it says, leaving a legacy is not what you leave behind, but what you leave inside of people once you're gone. And I would hope that that would be the message of my life.